Thinking back to grade school math, you might remember that if you have a number of unknown variables related to each other by equations, each additional independent equation reduces the dimensionality of the solution set by 1. Start out with a single equation with three variables and the solution plots out a 2D surface. Add one equation and you narrow the solution to a line on that surface. In science, we don't start with an equation that tells us what the answer is. That's actually the thing we have to figure out. So we do experiments and plot measurements with respect to controlled parameters. But the relation between the number of variables and the dimensionality of the plotted data still applies. With two variables, that is one measured value and one controlled parameter, you plot the data as a single line on a 2D graph. With three variables, the data plots out a 2D surface in a 3D graph, etc. But what if the problem is more complicated? Suppose you're given this basic fluid dynamics problem. What is the drag force experienced by a cylinder embedded in a flowing fluid stream? This would be like the force on a suspended power line in the wind, or the force on a bridge support in a river. Let's even simplify the problem further and restrict the scenario to incompressible fluids like water and assume that the surface of the cylinder is perfectly smooth. We will work through this question in more detail later, but just trust me for now. The drag force, per length of cylinder, varies as a function of four other variables. Radius of the cylinder, speed of the flow, viscosity of the fluid, and density of the fluid. So what would your experiment look like? Well, you might think that to be scientifically rigorous, you have to perform multiple experiments, varying one variable at a time, while holding all others constant. So you start by measuring force as a function of radius, while holding velocity, viscosity, and density constant. Then you move on to testing different velocities, but there's a possibility that velocity and radius are linked parameters. That changing the fluid velocity changes how the drag force responds to different radius objects. So you need to also measure the dependence of drag force on radius at each of the different velocities you choose to test. That is a two-dimensional parameter space you need to explore, and the resulting data can be plotted out as a surface in a 3D graph. If you do the same with viscosity and density, that's now a four-dimensional parameter space, and a whole lot of 3D plots you're going to have to whip up. Well, looks like you've got a lot of work to do. Better get started. Fluid dynamics is hard. But it's not this hard. As it turns out, you don't need to test a four-dimensional parameter space, nor do you need to plot out your results on a bunch of complex 3D graphs. For this experiment, you could get away with doing your measurements all with respect to one independent variable, and all of your data will fall onto a single curve. How? The secret is to eliminate the units. What do you mean? That makes no sense. If you've watched other science education YouTube videos, you might be aware of the Reynolds number. It's a value that represents the ratio of inertial forces to viscous drag in a fluid flow, and roughly predicts the transition between laminar and turbulent flow, and it spawned one of the nerdiest internet fanboy debates I've ever seen. It's also a value that has no net units. It's something called a unitless parameter, or dimensionless parameter. Now, some folks might find it weird that the Reynolds number has no units. After all, making sure the units work out in your calculation is basic science 101. Multi-million dollar space probes have been lost because someone botched the units in one small calculation. If units are so very important, why go unitless? Units are, indeed, of the utmost importance. At the end of your calculations, you know absolutely that the units must match up on both sides of the equation. If you finish your calculations and insist that the answer is x furlongs equals y stone's weight, you are getting fired before you instigate an engineering disaster that, at best, costs the organization a lot of money or, at worst, kills a bunch of people. Getting the units right is critically important, but it's also what some may call a solved problem. Using dimensionless parameters means solving the unit's problem first before getting to the real heart of the experiment. There are seven fundamental units of measurement. Mass, length, time, temperature, electric current, luminous intensity, and amount of substance, or number of molecules. Note that I'm not talking about any specific unit system here, like imperial or metric. 
I'm talking about the basic quantities that can be measured. Each fundamental unit that is relevant to your problem gives you an extra independent equation that reduces the dimensionality of the solution by one. For example, if your problem involves four variables, but all of those variables are measured in units that are some permutation of mass or length, then you can rearrange your variables into two groups, two dimensionless parameters, and restate your problem in terms of relationship between those two parameters. Solving for the units is called dimensional analysis. One formalized method of dimensional analysis is the Buckingham Pi method. Edgar Buckingham formalized Lord Rayleigh's method of dimensional analysis that was based off of a theorem proven by mathematician Joseph Bertrand. Buckingham Pi may be best explained by working through a simple example step by step. Let's take the question of drag force on a cylinder that we put forth at the top of this video. Step 1. Identify the variables. Let's start by listing out the variables that might need to be taken into account, classifying them in some general categories. Geometric variables are the ones that consider the physical size, shape, and dimensions of the experiment. In our case, there's one relevant geometric variable, which is the radius of the cylinder. We're incorporating length into the dependent variable, force per length. An important note is that the variables you choose should be unique. For example, you might think that cross-sectional area of the object is important. And it may be, but it's not independent of the radius in this case. We can use one or the other, but it would be redundant to use both. Next, let's consider material property variables. For the fluid medium, that involves characteristics like viscosity and density. We're keeping the problem simple and not explicitly factoring in the effect of temperature on those properties for now. Just note that temperature may need to be controlled in a realistic experiment. We'll also consider the cylindrical object as incompressible, indestructible, and perfectly smooth. The liquid is also being approximated as incompressible. Finally, let's consider the kinetic variables. These are the velocity of the fluid and the drag force. Again, we're normalizing force with respect to length of the cylinder, so force per length. So we have five variables. Radius, velocity, density, viscosity, and force per length. Step 2. Identify the units of your variables and count the number of fundamental units involved. Again, we're not going to use any specific unit system, but generic units denoted by these bracket letters. L for length, T for time, M for mass. Radius is measured in units of length L. Velocity units of L divided by T, or L times T to the power negative 1. Force, M times L times T to the negative 2. Density, M times L to the power negative 3. Viscosity, M divided by L and T. So that's three fundamental units in our example, mass, length, and time. To organize things, we're going to tabulate the exponents for each unit in each variable, like so. This table will be useful later on. We started with five variables, and now we have three additional independent relationships, one for each fundamental unit, that arise from the fact that the units must work out. This reduces the true number of variables to 5 minus 3 equals 2. The theorem says we should be able to group our five variables into two dimensionless parameters and express the data in terms of one parameter as a function of the other. We shall label those parameters pi1 and pi2. Step 3. Select the repeating variables and the primary variables. Each pi parameter will consist of one primary variable multiplied by the repeating variables in such a way that the units cancel out. Two hard and fast rules for selecting the repeating variables. One, the number of repeating variables equals the number of fundamental units, three in this case. And two, the set of repeating variables must contain all fundamental units. So we'll choose three out of five of our variables to be repeating variables, while each of the other two variables will be the focus of its own pi parameter. Also, two more soft rules or suggestions for selecting the repeating variables. One, select variables that are easy to control experimentally. Variables that are hard to control or that you're interested in measuring, like force, should not be selected. Two, select diverse variables. For instance, we started by categorizing the variables as either geometric, kinetic, or material properties. So we're going to select one variable from each category, radius, density, and velocity. Step 4. Solve for the exponents to construct the dimensionless pi parameter. Let's start with pi1, with viscosity as its focus variable. 
Pi 1 is viscosity times radius to the power a, velocity to the power b, and density to the power c. Now we solve for a, b, and c, such that the units of length, mass, and time all cancel out. There are a couple ways you can approach this, but we're going to use a table we've constructed. Or you can draw these funny brackets around things and call the tables matrices and make yourself feel more math savvy. Whatever floats your boat. Raising a variable to the power a means multiplying each exponent in the corresponding column by a, and so on. So the table looks like this. For the units to cancel out, all of the exponents in each row have to add up to equal zero. That gives us three equations for us to solve to get the values for a, b, and c. Solving the system of equations, we get a, b, and c all equal to negative 1. So the dimensionless parameter pi 1 is viscosity divided by density, radius, and flow velocity. Fun thing about dimensionless parameters, they stay dimensionless if you invert them. And ta-da, that's the Reynolds number. Let's now do the same for pi 2, with force per length as its primary variable. If you have the matrix or table already set up, we just need to swap out the exponents for the primary variable and reconstruct the new system of equations. Solving, we get a equals minus 1, b equals minus 2, and c equals minus 1. So pi 2 turns out to be force divided by density, velocity squared, radius, and length. Note that radius times length is half the cross-sectional area of the cylinder. After a bit of rewriting, this parameter is another well-known dimensionless parameter called the drag coefficient. At this point, some of you might have some technical questions about this process. If you stick around until the end of the video, I'll do a bit of Q&A to hopefully clarify some things. So now when you do your experiment and plot your data, you don't need some 5D graphical representation. You just need a single 2D plot of drag coefficient versus Reynolds number. And yes, indeed, all of the data points fall along a single curve. Keep in mind, I've been saying things like drag coefficient as a function of Reynolds number all this time, but it doesn't really matter what that function looks like exactly. And it can even change from one condition to another. At low Reynolds number, we get fully laminar flow, dominated by one functional form. With increasing Reynolds number, the function changes as we start to get vortex shedding. By the way, whenever you hear power lines or cables whistling in the wind, they're in this flow regime. The whistling sound is due to the frequency of vortex shedding. This jump indicates the onset of fully turbulent flow. But this data is for a perfectly smooth surface. If the object has a rough surface, the onset of turbulence is earlier. Note that when we add another variable to the problem, that is, surface roughness, the dimensionality of the solution increases by 1, and the data no longer fits on a single line. In addition to cutting down on the number of graphs you have to plot, another benefit of using dimensionless parameters is that it quickly gets you to the important scaling laws, so to speak. In a physical equation, the exponents are more important than the constants. They tell you trends, roughly how one parameter changes with respect to another. For example, at low Reynolds number in the laminar flow regime, drag coefficient scales close to inverse of Reynolds number, which, if you work it out, means that force scales directly with velocity. At higher Reynolds number, where you get wake turbulence, the drag coefficient is relatively constant, meaning the drag force now increases with the square of the flow velocity. The scaling law approach is especially useful if you work with large things like bridges and planes and need to do experiments on scaled down models before committing to building a real sized version. Vehicles like airplanes are often subjected to wind tunnel tests to examine their aerodynamics, but there are precious few wind tunnels large enough to accommodate real sized planes, and none of them can achieve exceptionally high wind speeds. But with a scaling relationship in hand, you can, say, build a one-tenth scale model of a fighter jet, stick it in a supersonic wind tunnel, and reasonably predict how the results would translate to a real-sized plane. It should be said, Buckingham Pi does not solve all of your problems for you. In practice, the hardest part of the method to get right is step one, being able to correctly intuit the list of relevant variables in your problem. The method also doesn't absolve you from actually having to run experiments, 
The method only reduces the number of parameters you have to focus on. It's up to you to do the actual experiment to determine what that relationship between those parameters looks like. Although in practice it can give you rational justification to avoid testing all of the variables, especially the ones that may be difficult to adjust, like density or viscosity of the fluid. I mean, that could be done by building your testing apparatus with full temperature controls, but that's sometimes more trouble and... And one final point. You still need to make sure the units work out when you're actually calculating each of the dimensionless parameters. Calculate the drag coefficient like this, and you're getting fired as quickly as Mr. Furlong's equals Stone's guy. So this is why dimensionless parameters are awesome. And despite all of the attention the Reynolds number gets, there are way more dimensionless parameters out there, like the Mach number and the Frude number. And yeah. To reiterate, the point of all of this is not to say that units don't matter. Quite the opposite. Units are of the utmost importance, but they're also a solved problem. All we're doing is solving the unit's problem first in order to get a head start on the really fun part of science, discovering something new. All right, for all of you who've stuck around, it's time to answer some frequently asked questions. There is some flexibility in choosing the so-called fundamental or base units. Length is very commonly used, but maybe you have a special case where everything depends on area or volume, and the math ends up being simpler if you work with one of those instead. Or take mass as another example. If length and time are already part of the set, then instead of mass as a base unit, you could use force, or energy, or power. Or instead of electric current as a base unit, you could choose electric charge and time. You get the picture. What about fundamental constants, like Boltzmann's constant? Those have units, and they appear in equations, but they're not variables? Sometimes you do need to sneak in fundamental constants, often as part of other variables. For example, relative permittivity, or dielectric constant, of a material is a unitless number but the proper variable to include is the electric permittivity of the material, which is equal to the dielectric constant times the vacuum permittivity. You may have to choose as a variable not temperature, but a measure of thermal energy, Boltzmann's constant times temperature. The gravitational constant is not a variable, but gravitational acceleration g might vary from its average earthbound value of 9.8 meters per second squared to something else in space, or even on different parts of Earth's surface. As long as you're following the rules I mentioned earlier, and atypical selection of repeating variables usually just gets you products or inversions of the relevant dimensionless parameters. In reality, a lot of dimensionless parameters have already been worked out, and the same parameters tend to repeatedly show up in similar problems. No, the more difficult and important task is correctly identifying the full list of relevant variables in the first place. I once had a professor who happened to be Russian and remarked upon scaling law approaches as being very French. I'm not exactly sure what he meant by that. Being a polymer scientist himself, he may have just been referring to the work of Pierre Gidegin, or maybe it was some Russian obsession with mathematical rigor. I don't know. Whatever the case, regarding scaling law approaches, vive la France, I guess. <laughs>